Well, a Russian spacecraft carrying two cosmonauts and a US astronaut has launched from Kazakhstan for, for the International Space Station. The Soyuz MS-24 spacecraft has successfully joined the current crew of NASA astronauts at the ISS, where they will commence their year-long stay. Russia's space program suffered a major setback last month when a spacecraft crashed during an attempt to land on the moon. The ISS is one of the few international projects the US and Russia work closely on. Meanwhile, the discovery of a new exoplanet has astronomers excited that it could be indeed signs of life. The planet, a bit smaller than Neptune, has been found to potentially have oceans and atmosphere with carbon dioxide. Joining me now live is ANU astrophysicist and cosmologist Brad Tucker. Brad, OK, so take us through this. So why <laughs> are researchers so excited that there could possibly be signs of life there? Look, so, yeah, so as you said, this planet is a little bit different. It's smaller than Neptune. It's what we call a sub-Neptune. So this is about eight and a half times the mass of our Earth. Now, this in itself is quite interesting because we look for rocky planets to look for signs of life, but this is something completely different. These sub-Neptunes have huge atmospheres and usually frozen ice, but in this case, because it's in the habitable zone, that zone not too far from its star, so it's not too cold, not too hot, means it could have liquid oceans on it. Now, we found three things in this atmosphere using the James Webb Space Telescope, this team. Firstly, as you said, carbon dioxide. They also found lots of methane. Now, these are two um, elements or, or molecules uh, in our own Earth's atmosphere, as well as Venus uh, and Mars. That is always interesting. It found hints of a third, though, that is really what got us all excited, uh, and that is dimethyl sulfide. Now, it's a very weak signal, but dimethyl sulfide uh, is a com compound of essentially methane, so carbon and hydrogens, uh, and sulfur. On Earth, we only really know this molecule to be produced by life forms, in particular things in the ocean, plankton. Uh, and it's a byproduct they give off. So this kind of is quite exciting. So you have a very different world, lots of carbon dioxide and methane, and maybe this other molecule that, as so far as we know on Earth, is only linked to life. So how similar is this then to Earth? Yeah, look, it's going to be very different, this place. Um, you know, the fact is it doesn't have a solid rocky inside. It's, again, mostly this ocean world. Um, the planet itself is just a different type of planet than even we have in our own solar system. And, you know, the atmosphere is going to be very different. Now, that said, just because this dimethyl sulfide on Earth is linked to life doesn't mean it has to be on another planet. Because this planet's very different, because the star it orbits is very different, it orbits a very cool star, um, it doesn't necessarily mean it couldn't be some sort of geological or natural process. But still, the fact is this planet being so different from what we normally look for life may have an interesting ingredient that we look for for life, obviously is exciting. Now, no, more work's done to confirm if it's real, and if it is real, is it linked to life? OK, well, we'll be standing by for more updates on that one then. Let's move on because NASA this week, this week rather released the findings from a year-long UAP study. Now, Brad, it found no evidence of extraterrestrial origins. Was that surprising? Look, not surprising, and, but, you know, all, the whole part of this process was to go systematically with a bunch of experts this data that's been released from the Pentagon that we've seen over time uh, in congressional hearings and things like that. Now, the reason it's not necessarily surprising is most of them, they did have explanations. Um, balloons, uh, drones, well, weird lights. One was a garbage that bag that flew up. About 98% were explainable. And this just goes to show when you have a huge amount of experts that come together to explain things, you can get an answer. Now, that said, they did say 2% they didn't have an answer. It didn't mean that it had to be from extraterrestrial life. It didn't even have to be real. They just couldn't say one way or another. And really, I think the punchline of this report, which a lot of us have been talking about in the community, is if we are going to be serious about the search for life, you know, we are just talking about getting excited by some sort of element on a different planet, we need to look at all phases, intelligent life around other stars, the idea maybe that it comes here, and bacteria and other things around other planets. And to do that, you need data and a proper investigation of it. So it's saying, look, we need more ways of investigating data up there or looking down here, coordinating and being open about it. And I think that's kind of the big benefit 
that we've seen in the past two years is an open discussion about the search for life, what it means, and systematically looking at the data. That's what we have in science. Because look, if there is life out there, I think all of us want to know. I mean, I would be excited. I'm excited by potentially <laughs> ocean marine alien farts, right? You know, that's that's what we we're talking about before. <laughs> so this is an interesting idea that, look, if it's there, let's find it. Oh, look, I mean, that's that's what we all want to know. We want to know that big answer. Is there life out there? But, uh, yeah, a shame it was just balloons, uh, garbage bags uh, in some cases. But, look, you know what? Always yeah. worth well investigating, of course. Um, exactly. Let's move on. Now, I, I was quite surprised by this because a supermassive black hole, Brad, has been found nibbling away on a star. Uh, how does that happen? <laughs> Yeah, this was kind of a surprise. So supermassive black holes, they swallow in gas and stars all the time. And we see these. We often call these tidal disruption events. Normally, when it eats the star, it eats it all at once. Um, the star gets too close. The gravity of that black hole rips apart the star. And that gas swirls around in this disk that you're kind of seeing here. In this case, what appears to have happened is this star is in a very weird orbit where it gets close but not close enough so it's all eaten. So it kind of a little bit is lost and then it comes back and a little bit is lost and it comes back and a little bit is lost. It's ended up in a very peculiar orbit where not all of the star has been eaten, but only little bits have been eaten at a time. Now we've never seen anything like this. In order for that orbit, for that way that star to come in with gravity to come in is quite unique. So it's telling us a lot about that possibility of how indeed stars and other gas falls into a black hole because it's a huge process in our universe that is quite critical to understanding how stars and galaxies and things like that evolve, and also just seeing the nature of how these supermassive black holes live. Well, we've gone from nibbling away on a star to uh, our next topic, with black holes have been burping up stars that they destroyed years <laughs> earlier. It's like a feeding festival. How, how and why does this happen, Brad? <laughs> so, yeah, so as these black holes swallow these stars, not all of the star falls into the black hole. So the black hole is a spinning object. It is a three-dimensional object. It's a ball spinning around. Sometimes as the star falls in, it kind of gets bounced and shot out in these huge jets, as you're seeing here, um, kind of perpendicular to where the black hole is spinning. So normally we see this happen all at once. The star falls in, the, most of the star gets ripped apart, that stuff falls into the black hole, but a little bit doesn't quite make it and get shot out in these huge jets. In this case, though, there was a huge delay that this process happened, the star got ripped apart, but then years later, periodically, this stuff got burped out. And again, so it's telling us a lot about exactly how that gas and star swirls around, how it exactly falls in or not falls into the black hole. It is not just this case if it gets near it, everything gets sucked in. There's a lot of subtleties in the process of just how this black hole operates. So really cool understanding in these subtleties and the different nature of how these black holes live their secret monster lives, whether they're nibbling or burping. <laughs> Oh, well, there you go. Gosh, you just never know what might be going on uh, out in that universe, Brad Tucker. Always good to speak with you. Thank you so much for joining us as always. Thanks.